on this edition of the Self Publishing Show. It's the same as any writing, any genre or any age group, as you put your character in a difficult situation yeah. and you remove any kind of support for them, you know, so exactly the same for children's books as you, your characters just happen to be children. So you need to get the parents out of the way so they just don't fix everything. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello, yes, it is The Self-Publishing Show with James Blatch. And Mark Dawson. Are you missing our audience? The live audience? Oh, well, of course. Yes, there's some splendid... Splendid authors there uh, in Florida last week. I'm certainly missing the weather. God, yeah, I'm really missing the weather. Um, but we are going to Vegas next month, so we've got that to look forward to. We do. Um, it was a, it was slightly rushed. Well, though we thought in advance that we would record a live episode of the podcast. I, you know, I'd never done it technically before. We'd never done it before. We weren't quite sure how to go about it, and it was mentioned towards the back of the um, the program. But I think it was good to do it a little bit low key, just so certainly from my point of view of, of organising and producing it, that I knew that we could do it and pull it off. But we did, and it was hugely fun. Yeah, it was, and it went well. It was the uh, I, I listened to it and well, in fact, watched it um, last week, and it was very good. Put together nicely, sound was excellent. Yeah, um, Got yeah, my new little sound device, uh, and we had beer, which we don't normally have, and we that certainly helps. Yeah, it helps everything in life okay i've got some um patreon supporters to welcome to the podcast if you go to patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show you can support this podcast and get lots of goodies and access to training live training as well uh, so i want to say a very warm welcome to simon estival to holly starkey to vicky tashman to angie green to the overcast sounds like a member of you too to kate jiggins and charlie pym uh, welcome all of you. Thank you very much indeed for supporting us and uh, being a Patreon supporter of the self-publishing show. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And uh, you managed all those names without butchering any of them. So well done. Yeah, I did pretty well. Do you know, two people came up to me in uh, in Lincoln, Florida and said, you got my name spot on. Don't, don't you listen to Dawson? Oh, Dan, know, well. Dan Smith and... Yeah, Pete, <laughs> actually one of, them, one of them was with Nala uh, and I sent the video over today of a testimonial interview she's done for our 101 course, mm. which brings me on to our 101 course. Uh, and she is called Nala. Well, Nala, she pronounced it. I, when I first saw it, I thought it might be uh, an Indian name, Nala. Uh, but she pronounced it Nala. And it's because her father was Alan and her brother's Alan. And <laughs> they, they, they couldn't tear themselves away from um, uh, from Alan. So she's she's Alan backwards. She's Nala. How did you uh, feel about is... Alan? <laughs> yeah. Feel good about that? Alan actually made a proper appearance in the... Uh, people I watch know. that podcast all the way to the end. They will see a brief appearance of uh, a glorious sight of Alan Partridge. Um, so, yes, Alla, uh, Nala said that I didn't butcher her name at all. Uh, and her name is Nala Henkel Aislinn, or Aislinn Aislinn. You're still not sure, are you? No, that is more difficult, I have to say. I probably did get that bit wrong. But Aislinn... Aislinn is how you'd pronounce it if it's the Irish first name, isn't it? I believe. Um, so, but in Canada... Okay. I'm not going there. <laughs> yeah, see, you just stand on the sidelines and mock. Yeah. Um, but it was great to interview Nala and a bunch of other authors in Vancouver um, on our way to Nink. Uh, really vibrant part of the world up there and lots of writers doing great things. We uh, got a great uh, uh, interview with Terry Tatchell, which is in the works. Uh, she's an Oscar-nominated screenwriter. There's a set of testimonial interviews people like Lisa, Lisa Zampano and Nala, who I've just mentioned, uh, and a yo-yo man jd mckay i think his name is he's a fantastic yo-yo guy uh so all of that is coming down the line now i mentioned the 101 course it is open as we speak at the moment uh, and also to coincide with that we have some training geared around people who are getting started in self-publishing and on that note remind me i've got a little update about somebody getting started in self-publishing oh my goodness okay to talk, to mention in a moment but uh what are we going to be talking about on our webinar next tuesday night mark we're going to be talking about reviews. So it's um, 10 ways to get reviews. It's always a difficult question um, as people are starting out. It's how to get reviews when you can't get sales. And you need reviews to get sales. You can't get one without the other. But then how do you get reviews if you don't have sales? It's very difficult to square the circle. So Sounds like uh, your favorite book. 
Catch Twenty Two. Um, yeah, it's not my favourite book, but it's a I book I, I book I quite enjoy. Um, I mentioned it. No, you told me you didn't like it. I don't. It's all right. I don't okay. mind it. I think it's all right. Um, okay. You're Syrian. You're Syrian. Um, yes. Yeah, so reviews. Um, how to get them ethically? You don't pay for them. All that, all that kind of stuff. So it's it's one of the um, uh, webinars. It's usually quite a popular one. Um, so uh, we're doing it twice. Um, so it's uh, as we record this is one tomorrow, but there's also going to be one on the Tuesday following the Friday that this this goes out. So Tuesday the what's the date today, James? It is the seventh. So the fourteenth. So okay. it's the fifteenth. So Tuesday the fifteenth, um, and you can sign up for that at uh, if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash one o one dash webinar, selfpublishingformula.com forward slash one o one dash webinar. That's very true. And and if you want to learn more about the course, you can go to uh, very easy selfpublishingformula.com forward slash one o one. There we are. Simple. It's almost as if we planned that. Yeah, almost as if we planned that. Excuse me, I am going to just shut down my email. Uh, yeah, it's normally, so, so it's rude. Normally, it's normally when I'm interviewing people in the evening, it's, I, I've got my uncle Andalay tonight to interview. It's messages ah. from you coming in. And I have to say to them, Dawson wants me to do something. <laughs> so uh, speaking of, uh, yes, of, of first-time writers. Yes, first-time writers. So my, um, I got to the end of my revision process uh, yesterday, actually. did You were quite right. I hate, I hate to say that, but you were quite right. It did take a lot longer than I envisaged it would from when we talked about what would have to happen. I basically went through almost every scene. Um, uh, any, anyway, I uh, did a lot of rewriting and uh, got to the end of it yesterday and have sent it out to three carefully selected beta readers who are authors in our... Mrs. Blatch. <laughs> Mrs. Blatch will read it, I think, at some point. Mr. Blatch Senior. In our community who who understand that it's not being copy edited yet, so they can look past the sort of mm-hmm. uh, bits of grammar and, and, and typos. I would send it to kind of readers at this stage because they'll just send me a list of typos and that would be a waste of their time, I think. Yeah. Uh, so I'm very excited. It's gone out to, to them. Um, uh, I won't name two of them, but one of them is Nathan Van Koops, uh, who's going to have a look at it for me because he's a pilot as well. Yes, he um, is. So he'll catch me out on some of the airspeed. And he's lovely. He, if he has any criticism, he'll deliver it in a friendly and yeah. encouraging <laughs> way. Carefully selected for that reason. Yes. Uh, so I'm really excited um, that I am now genuinely getting much closer to to releasing this book um my goodness yeah my goodness indeed i think we have to change the intro actually no we still we, we won't change the intro it's, no, uh... the intro can stand for a while yet uh but what i need to do is i need to do the 101 course you probably do yes you're going to the interesting interesting part now how many people are on your mailing list uh 450 how many of those are authors oh, i have no 449. idea 149 <laughs> yeah probably yeah your rules are going to be very interesting, but there's not much we can do about that. No. I don't think. But no, it's good. Encouraging. I'm looking forward to seeing this um, hit the virtual shelves. Yeah. How do you operate when you spend two or three hours a day writing as well as doing everything else? With some difficulty. Yes. I, kind of, uh, I am quite tired at the moment for lots of different reasons. But um, yeah, I'm actually taking the afternoon off. I did a bit of writing this morning, doing this now, and then I'm going to go and see Joker. Um mm. This afternoon, um, so I'm in Salisbury now, so I'm just going to wander down to the theatre, get some popcorn and watch that. Excellent, that would be good. Yeah, and then working obviously... this evening, so yes. uh, back, back on it again. I'm doing a webinar with Mark Lefebvre, Lefebvre oh, tonight. Yes, I am. Okay. So, uh, yeah, trying to psych myself up, get a bit of enthusiasm together for that one. Mark's lovely, though. So yeah, As I say, pleasure. I'm interviewing Michael Andalay tonight, and uh, we spoke to Michael at the London Book Fair, but these Book Fair interviews, we stand and we chat for 10, 15 minutes, but they don't get the same detail that we do on the podcast, and so I wanted to have a proper chat with Michael, who's been a huge figure in self-publishing, and talk to him a bit more about the directions that he's taken personally and his view of the industry. And in the same vein, somebody else we we met at London Book Fair's Barry Hutchinson. Mm-hmm. I didn't know Barry before the interview, so it was really interesting to talk to him. But during the interview, it became clear to me that there was definitely a longer interview to do with Barry. And what's been really interesting about him, uh, and this is somebody who plodded the traditional route, became dispirited at the, I think he worked out, didn't he? He got about 12 pence per book being sold in a supermarket. He once calculated he has moved into self-publishing and never looked back. And uh, he's very purposefully and business in a business orientated way uh, launched a new genre, uh, which is a detective, a Scottish based detective, a police procedural. 
And uh, that's what this interview today is about. It's about his approach to, as a writer, thinking, I'm going to do this for the commercial aspect. It's fun. He wants to write it, of course. There's always that overlap. Um, but it's also going to be decisions made that are going to be profitable for him. Absolutely. No, he's, and he's also a lovely, lovely guy with a lovely Scottish accent. Um, was this recorded before or after his, his car crash? It, this was after the car crash, and we do mention the car crash. So he had a, mm. yeah, he had a, a extraordinarily dangerous incident where he uh, came together with a cow. Yes. Well, it was, <laughs> to be fair, it was worse for the cow. The cow is now, is now in, being served in your branch yeah. of local McDonald's. <laughs> yes. But, yeah, he didn't do so well. But no, his yeah, car he... was a complete wreck. So if you can find a picture, it might be worth dropping one in. Yeah, um, roundabout now. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> good point, John uh, Stone, our video editor. There you go. Good work. I will get that to you afterwards. It magically will appear. Good. Okay, look. Let's hear from uh, Let's hear from Barry Hutchinson. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Barry Hutchinson. Welcome to the Self Publishing Show. Now you have been on before, but it was a sort of briefish interview at the London Book Fair, and right there and then, uh, I knew that you would be a guest who would return, so we can have a, a bit more time to talk through your amazing career, your uh, <laughs> da dalliance. Well, not dalliance. You you did what everyone did at that period, as you were traditionally published, and you scraped yep. and bowed and prayed that somebody would very uh, willingly or reluctantly take on your books and publish them for you and give you a tiny percentage in return. And then you discovered self-publishing and yes. now you're really taking it seriously. You've discovered or you've planned a new genre to write in. And as a writer, it feels to me like you're getting to where you really want to be now. Is that right? Yeah, I would say that pretty much sums it up. Yeah, yeah. I was traditionally published for 10 years. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, actually, my final traditionally published book came out. Uh, or two books, uh, two books in two different children's series. It was a third in a trilogy in each series, um, and that was two weeks ago. So now I'm, I'm kind of indie all the way. Yeah, indie all the way. Sounds good. Sounds like a good uh, t-shirt slogan for you. Okay, well, <laughs> look, let's talk a bit about the writing. So you started really in sci-fi, and um, uh, I was a big, I am a big Douglas Adams Hitchhikers fan. So when I talked to you at LBF, one of the first things I did was to download the first Space Team book and I read that and devoured it very quickly cool. and enjoyed it. Um, I have to, I'm Excellent. supposed to be reading in genre and strict instructions of my editors. I had to really pretend I wasn't reading it to her and then carry on reading <laughs> thrillers. But I've got a long list because there's quite a few Space Team books for me to get through. Um, and you did a bit of uh, yeah. Ben 10, I think you did some of the sort of writing for that franchise. Yeah, yeah, I did a lot of stuff early on that was, as well as doing my own books for publishers, um, publishers who thought that my style would fit some kind of brands that they had, they were doing books for, they got in touch. So so I did Ben 10, I did, uh, there's a video game Skylanders, I did books based on that. I did a book set at the David Beckham Football Academy, which is not something I'd care to repeat. Uh, and, I, and I did lots of comics based on, you know, Minecraft, um, DreamWorks Trolls, DC Superhero Girls. So as well as doing my own stuff, I've done a lot of, of licensed fiction or licensed comics for other publishers as well. And Ben 10 was one of the first ones that I did. I wrote uh, 15 Ben 10 books. Wow. One after the other, basically. So that means we probably have more than one Barry Hutchinson book in our house because Ben 10, it was it for a, I mean, a period of time at least, every boy at least had a Ben 10 lunchbox at my child's school. I don't yeah. know how widely that was experienced. But yeah, it was no, a big I thing think there was here. a good couple of years when it was absolutely massive and it was massive worldwide. You know, it was so it was books, it was uh, t shirts and toys. My son had all the toys. And they brought out different variations on the same toy every every new series series of the cartoon. So uh, it was all very cleverly done. Yes. And how did that pay? Uh, they paid well. As for someone starting out, they paid what seemed at the time to be a reasonable amount of money. I wrote them very quickly. I would write them in kind of a week or so of the Ben Ten books, and you would get a flat fee of I think around. £2,000, I want to say. So £2,000 at that time for a week's work for writing something that I, I kind of enjoyed writing. My son was a big Ben 10 fan, so I knew it really well. So it was quite quick and easy to write. And that £2,000, but then that was flat fee. And then when I look back and I see 
you know, how many of those books sold. Had I been on some kind of royalty, then obviously I would have made an awful lot more than that £2,000. But at the time, it was uh, it was a way of getting into writing from my point of view. It was a way of getting in with publishers, which I thought was the only way to do it. And at the time, it probably was the only way to do it. We're talking, you know, 12 years ago now. Uh, so so Kindle wasn't, wasn't a thing. Um, so it wasn't as easy to, to publish your own work. So, um, yeah, so I, I'm in two minds about it. I can look back and go, okay, for at the time, for the amount of work involved, £2,000 for a week's work is fair enough, you know, but had I been on a royalty, it would have been different. And was it a week's work in the sense that you passed on what you'd written and then they took care of the editing and the finalisation? And Yeah, it was basically that. It was basically, I, I kind of, they, they provided... The episodes, the, the the books I started doing, it was they would take a couple of episodes and we would turn those into each one was a seven and a half thousand word story, and the there was two pair of books. It was a fifteen thousand word book with two episodes uh, novelized in it. So uh, all I did was I sat down and watched the episode, and then I would just write. what well, I had a script as well of the episode. And I would just literally translate what was happening on screen or what was happening in the script into prose, and that was it. So it was dead. It was dead easy. There wasn't a lot of thought involved. Um, I got increasingly annoyed by the sound of the characters' voices. Uh, the more episodes that I did, but overall, it was a you know it was a fine experience, and it was. Um, I would have obviously more money would have been nice, but for for the amount of work involved, I can't really complain. Yeah, and that does sound like a good way of, of learning the trade because somebody's with ex, you know perhaps more experience than you had at that stage has done the arc of story, so you're yeah, really absolutely. you can also at the same time as translating it you can look at how they've done that and how they've told it because even a Ben Ten episode has to be a structured story right it's not you know absolutely yeah yeah I mean it, yeah and there there were there were fairly you know for for that sort of cartoon they were fairly well structured and, and fairly well written there was uh, the people who created it had all come from a kind of comics background and um and so they, they, they really knew what they were doing so um yeah it was a great learning experience that i was being paid to to do so um yeah i can't really complain uh, and then at some point you started writing your own books and did you get your publishing contract through that that experience through those contacts uh no actually i it was a that the publisher I wrote those books for, um, I, I didn't even show the the first book that I'd written that was all my own work. Um, I kind of lucked into, I luck into a lot of things in life, really. Um, and with with this book that I had picked up, I had seen in my local newspaper, there was a um, an agent was doing a kind of competition, a Scottish children's literary agent was doing a, a kind of meet and greet and a competition. You could submit a manuscript to them. They would read the first three chapters and then they'd pick 10 winners. And of those 10 winners, they would, they would then read the full manuscript and they would give them feedback on that manuscript. So that was the prize, was to get feedback on your manuscript. So I sent it in for the competition. And about, I think about two months later, I got a phone call from the agency saying, uh, we'd like to remove you from the competition. And I assume that meant it was so bad that they actually didn't want me anywhere near the competition. They just wanted me completely removed. Uh, <laughs> we don't even thought, want your words to pollute yeah, this Yeah, we don't even want this in this competition. Uh, but then they said, we'd like to represent, or like to talk to you about representation. So I said, okay. You know, I went down, I had a meeting with them, and they, they decided they were going to represent the book and represent me as an author. And they sent it to HarperCollins Children's Books. And then a few months later, HarperCollins Children's Books came back and said, we really like this. Could you do five more books and make it a series of six? And I said, yep, no problem. And they said, great, can you give us the next five outlines by two o'clock this afternoon? We have a meeting about it. So I then had to sit down and try and plan out the next five books in this series. Considering how Uh, slow uh, traditional publishers move, that's bonkers, right? Yeah, I found that happens all the time, though. It is, at at their end, is generally a kind of really slow, glacially paced, and then when they want you to do something, it's usually like, oh, yeah, we need it by Friday. And then you send it on Friday, 
after staying up all night to finish it, and then you get an out of office reply saying, "I'm not back until a week on Monday." Yeah, and you, <laughs> you tear your hair out. Uh, that's generally how it goes. But yeah, so they sent it to Harper Collins. Harper Collins said, "Can you do five outlines?" So I wrote quickly wrote five outlines, just one paragraph about what happens in each book, and they then came back and said, "Yes, we'd like to." take the six book series so it was really easy you know all yeah. this we all talk about how difficult it is to get 100 to rejection letters yeah just lucked into it basically i've had stuff rejected since then sure um ideas i've had but that that first series just went swimmingly and what what was that series uh it was a series called invisible fiends it's about a boy uh who when he's Four has an imaginary friend. Um, when he's twelve, his imaginary friend comes back and tries to kill him in a variety of Excellent. horrible ways. Okay. So it's a horror series, and it's quite full on horror. Um, so, but it won a few awards, and it, it kind of it, it sold reasonably well, and um, it's still out there in print. It's still it's still doing okay. Um, and but I learned a lot working with editors and and just shaping that each book and the series as a whole. Which I've obviously, you know, I've built on since then. I, I, I wrote over a hundred books for children in total. Wow! Some under my name, some under pen names, some licensed fiction, but, but over about 110, 120, I want to say. And when did and each one's a learning experience? You know, each yeah. one you, you kind of take that, even though it's kids' books, the the structure of a story is still essentially the same, no matter what age you're writing for or what genre you're writing in. Yeah. Uh, and let's talk about writing for children because I think that's not not an area a lot of people have a lot of experience with. And mm-hmm. I know from my time working alongside Mark Dawson and John Dyer as a BBFC examiner that the it's not simply whether you show blood or use strong language; it's the tone and the type of language you use is very different uh, the younger you go. And there's I would think yeah, quite yeah. a difficult art to getting that pitch right, particularly when you're you know in my case a middle aged man. Um, did you find that came naturally to you? Did you have to read a lot of other children's books to see how that language worked? And it came quite naturally to me. I've always been reasonably childish. Um, okay. I have kids myself who were round about the right age, so and I've been reading to them um, and just you know and just talking to them. But first and foremost, it was about the story for me, and uh, because it was nine to twelve, because it was horror, you can actually get away with quite a lot in that age group. That nine to twelve age group, there was no swearing. But, I mean, one of the, the scenes in the third book has, like, an elderly woman and uh, her fingers, the skin of her fingers starts to split and this scarecrow who's been using her as a disguise bursts free. You know, her eyes fall out and roll. So it's really graphic yeah. stuff. Um, and it's just that the main character is a 13-year-old, you know. So that, and that's all that really makes it uh, a, a children's series in that, in that regard. There's no, there's no swearing in it. There's no sex in it. There's no swearing um, and the main character is, is 13. Otherwise, had the main character been, you know, 25, that story could have been basically the same and the language wouldn't have been all that different either. Yeah, I suppose there's a long tradition goes all the way back to Ina Blyton and more modern times, Harry Potter and Stranger Things of putting children in adult situations, giving children the responsibility. And that seems to be yeah. what children enjoy. That's a fa- like fantasy, isn't it, when you're Absolutely, a child being yeah, grown yeah. up? and yeah, I mean, that's all All children's fiction. Essentially, they say, get rid of the parents in chapter one. Find a way to yeah. get the parents out of it um, so that the children can't just get their mum and dad to sort everything out and then put them in a, in a difficult situation. You know, it's the same as any writing, any any genre or any age group, is you put your character in a difficult situation yeah. and you remove any kind of support for them. You know, so exactly the same for children's books is you, your characters just happen to be children. So you need to get the parents out of the way so they just don't, fix everything and that's what most children's fiction you know involves so to move on slightly to space team i mean it's it's childish rather than for ch- children yeah, i would oh, say absolutely yeah um i've yeah, really i doubt. really enjoyed the first book it was a rollicking good laugh and it was um uh sort of anarchic but it's just that that kind of uh slight casualness to cow your main character that i think has a um a good tradition in in comedy um, who's a lovable, yeah. lovable, slightly annoying. Yeah, he'd be infuriating in real yeah. life. You know, if you if you if you knew him in real life, he would just drive Re- you demented, really annoying. But right, you kind of love him yeah, as well at the same of, time. And there's yeah, little so moments of, of genuine. 
<laughs> yeah, well, that was quite important. Is, is that it's uh, you know obviously it's comedy, and the further you go through the series, the more you can peel back the layers and you find out maybe why he's this annoying and. Mm-hmm. And that a lot of it is um, that he's kind of putting it on on purpose to mask a lot of pain that's going on in there. So the first book is very much, um, it's just comedy space adventure. I mean, I even hesitate to call it science fiction because there's no science involved in it, really. Um, it's, it's kind of comedy space fantasy, really. But the further you go on the series, there are the more you discover about all the characters and their backgrounds that kind of gives them, I hope, another depth beyond just these are some funny people doing doing funny things. But it's still basically a sitcom. It's, it's basically a, a, yeah. a, currently a 12-part sitcom in space. Yeah, I can see that. Set up at the beginning is this team who end up on this, uh, uh, this quest together, sort of rather thrown together and argumentative, and Cal, who they think is someone else, is their captain, yeah. who's the human, the earthling. Um, a sort of a Guardians yeah. of the Galaxy vibe to it, I would say. Absolutely. Guardians of the Galaxy, Red Dwarf, um, all these things are an inspiration for it. You know, I'm not I'm not going to hide the fact that these were an inspiration. I loved Red Dwarf growing up. Um, I think a lot of the humour in, in Space Team has some nods to Red Dwarf without ever ripping off any of the jokes directly. Um, and, and of course, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you know, that's in there somewhere. And, uh, and everything from the A team, you know, there's A team references come in, and so it's a real, um, yeah, it's a kind of an amalgamation of all these different different things that I really enjoyed, and I've, I've I've turned it into this this series. And did you write it because this is something you wanted to write, um, and and or did you yeah. think because I think commercially, com- comedic science fiction, I'm not sure how. Easy it is to say yeah, commercially. I had, or? I had no, I had no thoughts about the commercial side of it at all. The actual reason I got into doing it was that a school, a secondary school in Scotland, had asked me to go in and, and talk about how kids could publish their own work. And I had no idea how kids could publish their own work. I and mean, as far as I was concerned, you, you typed it and you emailed it to London, and you know, six months to two years later, a book appeared in the post, and that was my entire understanding of the publishing process. So I thought, well, okay, I can go in and do these workshops because um, being a children's author pays quite poorly. So a lot of children's authors make their money by by visiting schools and talking in schools. And the Scottish Book Trust in particular, they pay authors to go in and talk in schools uh, and talk in libraries and talk at festivals. So I thought if I could do this workshop where I'm I'm teaching, you know, secondary school students to publish their own work, then that's something else that might make me some money. So I'd had this idea for Space Team knocking about for a while and I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll write that and I'll test it. It's nice and quick to write. It's only 65,000 words it came out at. It took me three weeks. I thought, I'll write that. I will go through the process of self-publishing on Kindle and then I will know what I'm talking about when I come to deliver these workshops. So I wasn't even... I wasn't even really publishing a book. I was I was um, practising for a workshop I planned to deliver. And then the first book or the only book at that point started selling reasonably well it wasn't anything amazing but I think it sold kind of between 12 and 20 copies a day at 99 pence 99 cents and then I moved it up to 299 expecting it then to die a death and sales actually went up so at that point I was kind of making you know 30 40 pounds a day thereabouts and I thought okay, if I can do that with one book, if I put out a couple of other books, then potentially it will do better. They'll sell as well, and, and, I'll, and I'll have, you know, 100, 150 pounds coming in a day, which I thought would be amazing. Um, but then once I put book two and book three out, then kind of sales increased exponentially. Rather than just adding on, it kind of became a, a multiplication factor. And by the time book three was out, I was making more in a day from, from Space Team than I was making in six months from traditional publishing royalties. And that was kind of very much the point when I thought, okay, if that's three books, yeah. and if I have six books, then what's going to happen? If I have 12 books, what's going to happen? And um, and so then I kind of started really, really investing my time uh, into India, and I started reinvesting some of the money because I had no money to spend on, on Space Team to start with. So it wasn't until book three came out that I kind of started advertising and um, using Facebook and using EMS ads a little bit later on. But um, 
yeah, that's when I started investing in my kind of indie career. I realised then this is this has the potential to be much bigger than the traditional stuff. Yeah, and I think that's the point at which we spoke at London Book Fair when you had thought you wanted to do a different genre. And you'd obviously, so how did you cast about to decide what you're going to do next? Well, that was more of a kind of business decision, kind of a business decision. Uh, I, I, sci-fi is a huge market. Comedy sci-fi is not so big. Uh, and it's quite a kind of niche, limited market, but of which I've been doing quite well. And, but I think I've kind of exhausted all the new comedy sci-fi readers uh, on Amazon. So... I was looking around to see what else was popular. I thought I could do serious science fiction, but I've never really been I've never really been good at writing serious stuff, um, or or kind of I don't want to use the word dry, but because that sounds like I'm, I'm criticizing. But that yeah, that kind of serious dry or science fiction has never appealed to me. I always, I like my science fiction to be fantasy adventure stuff, so I kind of ruled that out. I had an idea for a crime novel, which was based on something that actually happened to me a few years ago. Um, and I thought, well, if I did that, crime's a big market. And I'd just, I just spoken, been on a panel with LJ Ross at the time. Uh, LJ Ross was doing really, really well, obviously, the way she was nailing it in, in crime fiction. And I thought, well, I wonder if I if I try writing this this crime novel I've got at the back of my head. And just see what happens there. So it was a business thing. I knew I knew crime was a massive, a massive genre, and I had this idea. I happened to have this idea for a crime novel. Did you so read? I thought, I'll give crime it a novels. go. No, not uh, I, I've never really been interested in reading crime novels. Um, I I read a, a few before I I started writing uh, a litter of bones, the J D Kirk, uh, the first book in that series. Um, so I read a few then, and um, and you know I you know I enjoyed them. Uh, not still not a genre that really calls to me particularly, but I thought I better have at least some understanding of how they work. But as I read it, I realised that they work much the same way as as any other genre. The actual story structure is always pretty much the same. It's just the details of. Of, of each genre is different, uh, so I had the, the the basis of a story, you know. So and I and I just went from there really. But I did even the name J D Kirk was very much. I looked at what was selling well uh, on Amazon, so so Louise L J Ross and M A Comley and and I thought okay, a short second name and, and two first initials that seems to do well, and I, I knew I was going to set the book in Scotland, so I. Kirk was quite a, a good Scottish name, Kirk meaning church in Scotland. Uh, so, and then I took the initials. I was going to be JT Kirk. But I thought, well, yeah, no, I'm not I was going to say that, that. must J- have fed into James it somehow. Kirk. I thought, <laughs> yeah, I thought that I'm not going to get away with that. <laughs> so I just tweaked it and became JD Kirk. So I don't know what the JD stands for, if I'm honest. No idea. No, I think that John was... Uh, Do- John Doe Kirk, I don't know. Uh, well, you know, when... Uh, you can reveal that to your adoring audience at some point in the future. You can make up for it. Yeah, uh, once, like I, once I figured it out, yeah. Morse's middle name wasn't always first name, actually. Um, okay, so, yeah, well, I, I thought that's... And I think you, you did say you were taking a more... Um, yeah, clinical sounds like the wrong word, but a more business-like decision. You're a writer well, this, and you want yeah, to make this, money. And Yeah, absolutely. This was... But, again, I think it's... I think I could have made other clinical decisions that wouldn't have worked because I didn't have a draw towards them you know i could have sat down and went okay i'm going to do romance romance is obviously the biggest biggest genre on kindle i'm going to i'm going to find a niche in romance and i'm going to write that but it, the idea of that does not appeal to me in the slightest i don't think i would be able to do it well uh whereas the crime fiction i had this idea for a story anyway that i really wanted to write at some point so it was that kind of crossover between what was a, a sensible business decision and what did i have a creative urge for. I think if I'd just gone with one or the other, then it, it would have failed. If I'd just gone purely business decision or purely where the heart you know leads you, I think it would have failed. So I think finding that crossover point was quite important. Yeah, and that's a great uh, sort of exercise to go through, I think, for people who are looking at genres. So what you want to write, what sells, and see where that, that sweet yeah. spot is. Where's that, that Venn diagram bit, yeah. and then what's the bit in the middle? 
Yeah. So in terms of the writing process, like first of all, how did you approach like your space team books, for instance? Did you did you plot them out in advance? Did you sit down and start writing them or? No, I, the space team, I generally have a vague idea of where it's going to end up. Uh, and then I just sit down and I write. And that is the joy of writing space team for me yeah. is that it's you can just, make stuff up. I, exactly. And it can go off on a tangent. And it, and I'm, I'm constantly surprised by what happens in space team, which is an amazing an amazing feeling. It's, it makes it a really fun series to write. Is that I can I can sit down and I have no idea what's going to happen in the next three hours, you know, or the next five thousand words, whatever it may be. The characters have, have they've kind of taken on a life of their own, and and they lead me off in these adventures, and I just kind of you know write about it afterwards. So um, that's yeah, space team is very much an organic thing. I've I've tried plotting some parts out and it never works so i just i just see where they take me but the crime fiction i knew that i had because of that who done it you know i had to sit down and well please procedural but there's that who done it element so i had to know who done it and i had to know start you know know how to plant the seeds that would lead in people off down you know to red herrings and down dark alleys and all that stuff so so the crime fiction was much more tightly plotted than Space Team, which wasn't plotted at all. And how did you enjoy, you obviously enjoy the experience of writing the Space Team books. Did you get the same enjoyment out of writing it when it was more tightly plotted? Yeah, it was different. Um, I mean, starting a new series, when, you're, when you've been writing about these characters, because I said there are 12 Space Team books, there's a spin-off series for other characters who are in the Space Team universe. I did another novel called The Sidekicks Initiative, which is basically space team with superheroes. So it's an entirely different uh, universe that's set in, but it's much the same in the sense that it's a team and it's comedy and and the kind of misadventures that, that they face. So going to something which was, was much more grounded in reality was was quite difficult because I've, I've never researched anything I've done in my life. My, all my books, all those hundred-odd books, apart from the ones where I had to base it on an existing license. Everything has just been made up. There's been nothing that I've had to research or find out about or places I've had to go and see or any of that stuff. But this being one set in the real world and um, two involving uh, police procedure, I actually had to do some research for the first time in my writing career, which really came as a shock. I had to go and find stuff out. But I, found, I actually found that I quite enjoyed that process as well. And I spoke to a few police officers and um, I went to different locations and, and, and took photographs and all that stuff. And, and I found it that quite an enjoyable experience, which I didn't expect. I've always resisted having to do research, but I actually found the research was quite fun. And it, and it led to lots of other story opportunities. You know, I, I, as I researched, different plot ideas occurred to me and I... I the, by the time I'd researched the first book, I had ideas for book two and three as a result of that research. So, so that was really useful. The sitting down plotting a bit, I didn't particularly enjoy uh, the actual plotting part. I, I'm not a plotter by nature uh, and never really have been. And I kind of struggled to, I would, I would kind of plot, I'd have the ending and I knew who'd done it. And then I'd plot like five or six chapters and go, oh, that's enough. I can just start writing. And then I'd have to backtrack a bit because I, you know, I hadn't set things up properly. So for books two and three, I plotted them fully in advance before I started writing. Book one, I kind of partly plotted and and partly made up as I went along, but definitely helps having having plotted them out. It definitely makes it easier come the writing stage. How comprehensive are the plots? How many, how many sort of words do you use to describe um, it? I, well, I, I don't know, because I, I use notebooks. I, I longhand the plotting oh. part, uh, wow. and I have a notebook, and I, and I and I kind of scribble stuff, and I draw a little diagram, so then I do, and then I'll sit down and probably go over five or six pages. We'll plot it out, and I roughly chapter-by-chapter chapter basis. So, you know, chapter one, this happened, chapter two, and that is fairly flexible. Sometimes chapter one will run into chapter two, or sometimes what I think is one chapter will actually be three chapters, but the beats of the story are all there, written longhand over over kind of five or six A4 pages. Um, you should tell us a bit about this first story without obviously giving away who done it. But you said it was something that happened to you. Yeah, kind of. Basically, uh, a 
about four years ago now, uh, three or four years ago, I was in a place called Leenachan Forest, which is about 10 miles from where I live. Popular dog walking location. I was there with my daughter. We took our dog, a golden retriever. And there's a stretch where you can literally see a mile in both directions. This, just this big track. On the right is a, a big forest. On the left used to be a big forest that's all been cut down. So And you can see across the hills. It's a lovely, lovely walking spot. So the dog one day ran into the trees and would not come back. We were shouting, we were shouting, the dog would not return. My daughter, who was seven, started to get really worried, thinking the dog had gone missing. So I told her to wait there while I went in and found the dog. So I went in. I was gone for about 90 seconds before the dog came running up to me. When I came back, my daughter was gone. And I had this like icy cold moment of terror when I thought, I, I can see a mile in both directions, She's not here, therefore someone has taken her. And I I had no phone signal and I was just in a kind of, just seconds of panic before she popped up from behind a bush laughing her head off and she just decided to hide on me. Uh, so driving home, finished the walk, bundled the dog in the car and driving home. And as I was driving home, I thought, but what if someone had taken her? What, what would I have done? What would... You know what would have happened next, and by the time I had got home, I'd had this vague idea for a, a detective novel written, uh, plotted out in my head, very vaguely, loosely plotted, and that's what happens in there. That's what happens in chapter one of A Litter of Bones. There is a a man walking his dog with his son, and the son goes missing. The son gets taken while the the dad's looking for the dog in the trees. And it ties into an old case that this detective down in Glasgow has dealt with in the past. It was a, a series of child abductions and murders. And the person responsible has been locked up for the last 10 years. But there are so many similarities between this abduction and those abductions that he gets brought in to lead the case. And over the course of the book, he starts to doubt whether he has arrested the right man uh, for these previous crimes. Ooh. And I won't tell you any more than no. that. Sounds great. We should say, uh, people wonder where you are. You are in the Highlands of Scotland. I um, am indeed, yes. I'm up so. in Fort William, right at the foot of Ben Nevis. So all the first book is based around Fort William. Book two is based up near Loch Ness, which is about kind of 50 miles from where I am, 45, 50 miles. And then the third book is based in Inverness itself, which is the city at the other end of Loch Ness. So about 65 miles from here. So they're all Highland based, all featuring the same lead character. Uh, a beautiful part of the world, I have to say. And um, uh, very sort of LJ Ross in that inspiration that she uses, the landscape and locality is very much a feature of her books. Yeah, I think it's, you know, I think the when you're looking at a genre as big as crime, I think trying to go, I'm trying to appeal to all crime readers is you're not going to get anywhere. It's too big an ask. So if you can focus on on one element of that, LJ Ross has done obviously uh, that, that kind of northeast area, like you say, and then she has an, an element of romance in it as well. So she's kind of, um, she's created her own thing there, which is great. And she's doing really well as a result. Um, the This is set, like I say, around the Highlands. There's not really any romance in it particularly, but it's, uh, a lot of people locally are reading them because they're based in an area they know. So, and a lot of people love Scotland. A lot of people internationally love Scotland and have ancestors who come from Scotland. So, yeah, so it seems to be appealing to people that, that like murder and Scottish things, which is which is nice. There seems to be a big crossover between those two groups. Yeah. <laughs> Another Venn diagram. Um, yeah. Right, and how's it going with sales? Uh, fantastically well at the moment uh, book, book one is number 19 in the, in the Amazon UK chart uh, book one two and three are number one two and three in the Scottish crime charts on Amazon uh, it book one quickly began to outsell everything else I've ever written combined wow so I had for for book three I had about six and a half thousand seven thousand pre-orders I think uh, so yeah going fantastically and I'm actually getting 
for the first time ever. I took my wife to the dentist the other day, and then when I came out, uh, one of the dental nurses came running out after me and asked me to sign the book because they know locally that I've that, that I am J D Cook. So she came running out of the dentist, and I was standing in the dentist's car park signing her book. So um, yeah, it's gone brilliantly. Um, I've had been approached by a TV production company who are interested in it, and yeah, I mean it couldn't it couldn't be going better at this stage. And I have a book bub this time next week ah. on the first book, which which should be should be amazing. So I'm hoping to crack top ten on Amazon UK uh, with the book bub. That'd be amazing, and maybe you know good yeah. inroads in the states as well. So let's talk about marketing. Then you mentioned book bub. Then what what was your sort of marketing marketing strategy for these this series? Uh, I have only targeted the UK. Um, Scottish crime fiction, although it's doing well, it's, I mean, it's, it was number one in Amazon Australia, completely off its own back. I don't quite know how that happened. I don't think you need to sell many copies to be number one in Amazon Australia, though. So uh, it wasn't it wasn't that impressive, but it was it was still an Amazon number one bestseller, and I am claiming that. Good. Uh, US, uh, Canada, do, organically, I think in the US it's sitting about a uh, thousand overall in the store. But I've wanted to focus my kind of marketing efforts on the UK. So I have been using Facebook advertising and I've been using AMS ads. And I've I've just started dabbling with BookBub advertising at the moment. I mean, the, the series is exclusive to Amazon. So I was really lucky to get a BookBub. I, I was very surprised that I got a BookBub on it because it's in Kindle Unlimited and uh, you know, it's in KDP Select. So I was very surprised, but delighted, obviously. They actually, I had a... I had a car accident a couple of weeks ago that I mentioned before. Uh, we hit a cow coming back from Glasgow. And I got the email from BookBub as we were standing at the side of the road after this car accident. You know, I was thinking, oh, life is terrible. Car written off, dead cow a, a couple hundred yards away and myself and my son standing in the pouring rain. And I got the BookBub email saying, you have been selected for a BookBub. So that really brightened the evening up, yeah. actually. <laughs> um, it was like a, a silver lining to an otherwise pretty pretty terrible evening. Uh, yeah, for, so, for you, not yeah, your son. So, it's, it's, he didn't, it's he like didn't that care, moment no, to the office. Although, how, how is that good yeah. news for me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he didn't quite get my excitement, or nor did the police when I told them. Oh, you were telling them as well. Um, <laughs> well, well, we should yeah, say yeah. It, was a, it was a rather serious uh, road accident. I think has shaken you yeah, up a little yeah, bit. So, was, we wish you one yeah, year recovery I mean, from that. But. It was kind of miraculous that we we escaped relatively unscathed. We we turned a corner and there was a cow standing in the middle of the road. It was dark and it was the cow was black. So all I saw was was kind of feet. The light hit the feet, and I thought, oh, and then impact and uh somehow we we walked away on on heart i'd hurt my wrist and when i was holding the wheel but otherwise my son had a, a bruise the size of like a five pence piece on his knee but otherwise intact and when, when i look at the photographs of the car i don't quite understand how we escaped intact or how after hitting the cow we couldn't see anything so we hit a cow then we hit a road sign and the car actually stopped in a, a lay-by in a parking space at the side of the road, just perfectly off the road, out of the way. So yeah, we were really, really lucky that that, that we escaped it. Well, if you follow um, Barry on social media, you can see pictures of that uh, of the car, yeah. and it's uh, it's yes, um, a nasty experience. But sound also sounds like something that could go into a book at some point. Absolutely, yeah, it's already in the plan oh, for book four. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, it's already. I've already got a plot out in, in book four, and the two the two policemen who who came out to kind of to help us. Um, there was a point when I was on the phone to the insurance company outside. I had no signal in the car, so I had to go outside. And my son was telling them about the crime fiction, so they kind of basically petitioned for parts in the next book. So um, they are they are kind of insisted they're going to be in book four. So so fair I'm writing enough. them in. Yeah, fair enough. Um, good. Well, I'm, it's an amazing um, story, and it's not an untypical story for writers who were there before the whole digital thing took place and mm. afterwards. Those people have embraced it. It's a democratizing movement, and you used some pretty strong words. I think when we spoke in LBF, when you look back at how the traditional model doesn't really benefit authors. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would absolutely say that. Yeah, I mean, it benefits some authors. You know, there are there are some authors who will get a six figure advance, and then 
you know, they'll go and write in a book or someone else will write a book for them, as is often the case, and they will put their name on the front if they're a celebrity. Um, but yeah, they'll get big, big deals and they'll do well out of it. Uh, for the rest of us, kind of mid-list and down, it's it's not a fair model, really. I mean, I, you know, if I sell a, a six ninety nine book through a traditional publisher, I will get at best about fifteen pence of that that money. If I sell a two ninety nine book on Kindle, I'll get two pound ten pence. So, the, so from that point of view, there there's no competition. But what I've what I've enjoyed most about going indie is I feel creatively recharged. I I spent. 10 years trying to appease publishers and trying to come up with ideas that I thought publishers would like and then changing those ideas until the publisher agreed to publish them and give me a small amount of money. And I've worked with some really good publishers. Don't, yeah. don't get me wrong. I don't want to say all publishers are terrible. Some of the publishers I've worked with have been amazing. I just think it's the model that has has the problem uh, because now, as I say, I get to write the books that I want to write. I get instant feedback from readers. I don't have to wait two years for the book to come out. I can put it out, you know, three days after finishing it if I want. And I get instant feedback from readers. And it becomes, obviously, there's there's marketing involved, there's advertising involved. But as a traditional author, you're expected to do that anyway. But now I have control over it. I can set the price of the book, which I can't do if a, a publisher's put it out. And I can instantly see if my marketing efforts are having any impact. You know, if a, a traditional publisher puts a book of mine out, they set the price. If I do advertising, I I will find out eight months later how that book is sold. And I can't, you know, correlate those sales with anything I've done. I just have to go, okay, well, maybe it had an effect. Whereas marketing as an indie, I can immediately go, okay, I spent that much more on advertising yesterday. I've targeted these groups of people and I've sold these many books as a result of that. And if I stop that marketing and I see a decline, I go, okay, I can now go, that definitely sells books. Or this thing I'm doing doesn't sell books because I've seen no no increase in sales. So the the ability it gives you to, to kind of take charge of your own career, because nobody cares about your books as much as you do. No editor in the world, no, no publisher, no marketing team, none of them care about your books as much as you do. The only people that care about your books as much as you do are your readers and your fans. So if you can cut out that bit in the middle about those people who aren't as invested as the people at either side, then, you know, all the better as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And you say the system works for people uh, who get six-figure advances, but if if Macmillan came up to you or any of the other other publishers are available and said, here's £150,000 for a new crime series from uh, J.D. Kirk, Fifty thousand pounds a book over the next three years, and then fifteen percent. What would you say? You'd say no, yeah. wouldn't you? I would say no. Yeah, yeah. because again, I, 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 at the moment, I get to write the books that that I write, um, and or that I want to write, and financially, yeah, I, I couldn't justify it. If they came no. offering me a million, I might do it and yeah. write it off. You <laughs> know, and go okay. So, I don't, I'm not invested in that series, <laughs> but, but, um, yeah. Financially, for for that sort of figures, I I couldn't justify it. No. Captain Kirk doesn't get out of bed for. 150, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Is it, the author is J D Kirk. The author is J D Kirk. Yes. Yeah, he's not. Yeah. He's not. Yeah, yeah. He's not, he's not you can't Kirk, make him no. Captain Kirk. Yeah. 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 No, he's D C I Jack Logan. Okay. He's the, yeah. the, the the detective. Logan's Run. Yeah. Or reference, but I don't know. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So Wolverine was actually the thinking. It was uh, Wolverine oh, okay. the X Men. There you go. Um, so yeah. where you're, you're obviously you're writing book four now, and um, yes. do you what, do your plans extend beyond this series? Uh, I've got plans for uh, up to book six in this series. Uh, the the seeds of book six are actually sown in book one, and I knew before I started book one, I knew what book six was going to be. So I have that planned out very loosely, and then I plan each book individually as I, as I do it. But the overall story arc is planned out to book six. I am I have promised Space Team fans that I'm going to write another Space Team as well. So I'm I'm juggling another Space Team in there somewhere too. Uh, so yeah, so that's all I have planned at the moment. It's another space team, and then the next three books in the DCI Logan series, and then we'll see what happens. We'll see. Uh, I I fully expect to do more crime writing. Uh, I have an idea. I might continue this series up to book twelve, or I might go in a different direction and and try something else, but still within the same crime genre. 
Oh, it's a bit like that other famous Scottish author, Ian Banks, and Ian M. Banks, who had his science fiction series that he went to, and he obviously loved writing yeah. and his more sort of literary fiction books. That, uh, although I think I re- definitely read an interview mm. once. He said, people always assume that I write the science fiction for the money and the literary books for the kudos. He said, it's the other way around. The literary books yeah. are the ones that made all, all my money, and I, yeah, and I love writing yeah. science fiction. He, he loves writing science fiction. Yeah, Actually, Ian Banks was... was kind of instrumental to me becoming an author. I'd wanted to be an author since I was nine and I had a, an English teacher in, in high school who told me not to be so ridiculous uh, that it was never going to happen and to, to focus on being, maybe go and be an English teacher instead. I think he was maybe going over some old trauma of his own. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, but uh, Ian Banks came to my school when I was about 17. Wow. Uh, and I'd kind of been, I'd been really disheartened by this English teacher, you know, re- and because he, he repeatedly kind of shot me down saying, you know, forget this. Ian Banks came and Ian Banks did a talk to my class and had a chance to go and speak to him afterwards. And um, and I told Ian what this English teacher had said and he used quite a lot of creative, colourful language <laughs> uh, uh, about the teacher and told me to go and do it. So fast forward about 20 years. No, not quite 20 years, about 15 years. Uh, and I found myself at a book festival that I was, I'd just done a talk at, and I was put at the signing table next to Ian, next to Ian Banks. Wow. Uh, and so we were both sitting signing books together, and I told him about this, you know, the, when I'd spoken to him in the school, and he remembered going to the school. Um, and after, so I, I said, oh, we thanks so much, you've helped put me on this path. And then to his eternal credit, a little bit later, he came up and caught me and he bought a copy of the book and he said, can you sign that for me? And it was like, oh, this wow. is amazing. Wow. So uh, an absolute, absolute gentleman and just uh, such a such a loss, you know, an amazing author and, yeah. and just such a nice, nice guy. Um, so, yeah, so Ian, Ian Banks put me on the, the, the road to becoming an author. Interestingly, I have a little side story to that. Uh, a couple of years after that, I was at the Edinburgh International Book Festival and I was doing an event there and the English teacher who told me that I would never be an author came wandering into the festival venue oh. and I made an immediate beeline to him <laughs> and said, hello, do you, do you remember me? And he said, oh yeah, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm, I'm talking about my, my book series. And his kind of face fell and he said, oh, oh well, I might, I, might, I might come and listen. And I said, oh, you can't, it's sold out. And then walked away. <laughs> I hadn't sold out. No. <laughs> I was I d- damned if I was telling him that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, what it, life doesn't give you those moments very often. No. Um, but but uh, uh, it gave me that one. So uh, yeah, that was good. In, in the same way that that one teacher can be the massive inspiration, you could also get that one teacher who just squashes it. And Absolutely, yeah, down, so. yeah. And I had a couple of teachers who were really, really inspiring, but he yeah. had kind of chipped away at that. I was in that sort of 14, 15, 16 year old, really a bit self-conscious, not quite sure mm. yourself. And he had chipped away at, at, at my kind of confidence in terms of writing. And then Ian Banks had, as I say, he'd used some colourful language and told me to just go out and do it. And I did. Good. A fantastic story about Ian Banks. I mean, I, I, to my shame, I've never read any of his big literary books, like The Wasp Factory is most famous and, and so on, but yes. I've devoured almost every one of his culture series, uh, science fiction yeah, books. Amazing, he is amazing the most books. brilliant yeah, writer. Yeah. Brilliant, yeah. brilliant writer. Well, you should yeah. read his other loss. stuff as well. Read Wasp, yes. Wasp Factory and Crow Road are great, great, and really yeah. good Scottish fiction. Yeah, definitely, definitely on the list. And um, yeah, very sad. He was quite young when he passed away, maybe early 60s or something like that. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Far too early. Right. We have been chatting for 50 minutes. Uh, Barry, uh, I knew it would be brilliant talking to you. It's gone really quickly. Um, what I wanted to get out of this was the the process of switching genre and going about, as a writer, choosing something that's going to pay effectively. It's going to make your yeah. writing um, you know, worthwhile and so on. And that's, I think, what you've explained very clearly to us. Yeah. I mean, I mean Space Team did pay in the sense that it, I, I managed to find... I think pretty much everyone in that niche, in that comedy <laughs> sci-fi niche, hundred percent conversion uh, so, rate. Yeah, pretty, so so that did because there, there wasn't a lot of comedy science fiction available at that point. You know, there was obviously Douglas Adams going way back, Hitchhiker's Guide, but there had been a kind of bit of a drought in terms of comedy science fiction, which Space and Space Team came along and and filled that gap. So Space Team did well. You know, I I spent ten years never knowing if I could pay my bills in two months' time. 
as a traditionally published author. And then Space Team came along and, and we've bought a house, you know, so with, with Space Team's money. So Space Team did well, but it's being dwarfed by the crime fiction, that bigger genre. Uh, yeah, that's just, just being dwarfed by that at the moment. Well, congratulations, Barry. Couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Really uh, thrilled for you. Well, and thank you very much. It's going to be more and more, I'm sure. And uh, I think as we speak now, we're recording this in September 19, but I know that you are yep. signed up for SPF Live in London in March. I am, absolutely. Can't wait. Yes, yes. Yeah, so we're going to get you down yeah, there. Yeah, really looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah. I know you've signed up just to come along as a, a punter, but you will probably be roped into doing something for us at that point. <laughs> okay. I know people will want yeah, to hear from you, so... Always happy to talk. Super. Thank you, Barry. Excellent. Thank you. This is the self publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go. That lovely Scottish lilt. Yeah, very nice guy. And um, he and I, big Douglas Adams fans, and I really enjoyed reading his first Space Team uh, book. Um, now, I didn't mention it in there because I wanted to check with him first because he wrote a very nice little essay at the back of his first Space Team book about his mother dying of cancer and coming up with a story. And I should probably have mentioned it in the um, in the interview, but at the time, I think I wasn't sure whether I'd normally check with somebody first about that kind of uh, personal detail. But it's worth reading that book to see how these ideas come to you and a very personal way that he's written a quite... Um, you know, relatively anarchic sort of uh, science fiction, uh, even more anarchic, I would say, than Douglas Adams, but very funny. I'm looking forward to getting through uh, the rest of his Space Team books. That's my level. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. My level at the moment is um, six year old, his, his books, Pirates Love Underpants, I read last night. It was Pirates a, Love Underpants, that sounds a th- like a perfect book for a... A thrilling story yeah. um, with a big twist at the end. You know, was, um, Samuel enjoyed that very much. So that's my level at the moment. Good. Okay. Well, a reminder that you can uh, sign on for a webinar, how to get your first or next 10 reviews with Mark Dawson uh, next Tuesday nights. That's Tuesday, the 15th of October. If you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash 101 dash webinar, that will take you uh, to the sign up page for that. And if you want to check out the 101 course, which is the platform building course that every self-publishing author uh, shouldn't be without. So I say that correctly, mm-hmm. uh, helps you set up your platform uh, for a commercial future for your writing. Uh, and if you want to learn more about that, if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash 101. Where did you go last week, James? Where did I go last week? So last week, where did I go last week? Where did I go last week? Pugwash, there's a clue. Operation Pugwash. Ah, yes. So last week, um, Last week, I went to the ship that we're going to book for the evening do for SPS Live next year. Uh, and it's marvellous. Yeah, it is a Mississippi steamer. It's not really a Mississippi steamer. The pe- people taking us around it didn't know anything about its history, but I was looking at a few plaques here and there and pretty certain it was built somewhere in Europe uh, as a replica. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, it is amazing and it's going to be a hugely fun evening. It is, yes. Um, 600 people, is it? 600 people on the boat? Something Take like that. 620, yeah, and we will fill it without question. Yeah. yeah. We have a jazz band ready from, from our own community. Buster Birch has stepped forward and said he's going to provide the jazz music. So, uh, yeah, yeah details, details of that. And if there are any tickets after we've gone through everybody who's going to the event, if there are any tickets left, we'll offer them out to people who aren't registered for the event. I'm not sure we'll get to that point. But if you if you join the Facebook group, if you search for SPS Self Publishing Show Live, there's a Facebook group. You can join it even if you're not going to the event, just to keep in touch with what's happening. Right. Uh, my camera is literally about to overheat, so I'm going to very quickly say it's been an absolute pleasure, Mark, talking to you. Enjoy the Joker. I will do. Yes, I'm going to be uh, seeing what all the fuss is about. Yeah, no, it sounds really good. Only one newspaper hated it, and it's the newspaper that I hate. So I think the it's Guardian. a good film. It was Guardian, yeah. Yes. So I think it's a good film. Great. Uh, Mark, thank you very much. Uh, and it only leaves me to say that it's going to be a goodbye from him. And it's goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash self publishing show. 
and join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.